Welcome back to Talking True Crime. And before I introduce my guest, there are a few cases I want to discuss. What has gone wrong with our police service? In my day, it was rare for an officer to be charged, but now it's become a regular occurrence. I don't believe that it is because officers turned a blind eye in, in my day. No, I firmly believe it's because the floodgates have opened and recruitment standards dropped so low, now police have to fill quotas. Yes, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police has said that two or three officers every week for months are going to be facing charges. And in addition to that, we've got the West Midlands police officer, Hadia Sadiq, who's been convicted of abduction and the sexual abuse of a 13-year-old child. Public confidence in the police and morale is at an all-time low, causing respect to drop and ultimately law and order to suffer. The police need the public to trust them because without that, law breaks down. So it's a total mess. Also, we've got this very strange ongoing case of Nicola Burley. So Nicola was last seen Friday, the 27th of January, dropped her children off at school. But she then goes to walk her dog, Willow, at a nearby area alongside the River Way. A massive police search is now underway. And the police have said they remain open minded and that they don't think that there is anything suspicious occurred. Nicola's parents have come out, in fact, today and yesterday and said there is something wrong. She has to have been taken because she wouldn't just leave her dog and her two daughters. Since her disappearance, Nicola's phone has been found. So it was still connected to a call that she had with work. And beside that bench was her dog without a harness and that dog has now been recovered but crucially that dog was not wet so what has happened to Nicola well she could have fallen into the water but if that occurred then the dog would have gone down the bank and I also believe probably would have tried to help her but no the dog was completely dry and if she'd have been taken away or she'd have been abducted the dog would have barked but if she'd have gone, would she have left her dog? I mean, people are very close to their pets. So why would she have put an elaborate plan together and left her dog there on its own? It just doesn't make any sense. As the days go by, of course, it becomes more and more serious. The concerns grow. I am surprised the police have taken the approach to say that they don't believe anything suspicious or a third party has been involved. Perhaps they know more, but they're certainly not letting that on to the family if they know more, because the parents have said themselves that they believe a third party is involved. So we don't know yet. And I hope that over the next days we will get answers because the family, of course, need that. They are living on tender hooks with every single piece of news. So what has happened to Nicola? Let me know your thoughts. Obviously, it is a live investigation, and we all hope that Nicola will return home as soon as possible. Anyway, moving forward, we've now got an incredible guest. That Now, my guest has been through an awful lot, through what most people couldn't even cope with. Let me give you the background. Three men from Cardiff spent a decade in jail, wrongly convicted for the murder of news agent Philip Saunders in 1987. Operation Fortitude and Resolute were set up to review that investigation. And the findings against South Wales Police were critical. But the band that led this and pushed this was Michael O'Brien. He was one of those three individuals who spent 11 years in jail. He was cleared, along with Darren Hall and Ellis Sherwood. They became known as the Cardiff News Agents Three. Police officers used very underhand tactics. They named civilian witnesses, had purged, had purged themselves. Detective Inspector Stuart Lisi, and now Lewis, now retired, perverted the course of justice. And Detective Inspector Lewis also fabricated evidence against Michael O'Brien and Sherwood. The investigation analysed more than 20,000 documents, interviewed six people under caution and took more than 90 witness statements. Michael O'Brien, whilst he was on remand, had some really tragic news as well. That was the cot death of his daughter. So, a man that's been through an awful lot. The criminal justice system hung him out to dry, but it was only his fortitude and his determination that enabled, finally, justice to prevail. And that meant him being acquitted 
and finally being released from jail. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. There's so much to talk about. What's your feelings now, if you could sum it up, of what you've been through? Long enough. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, I also lost a son since I've been out as well. Um, in, in 2012, sadly, my son passed away to a rare genetic disorder. Um, the, the whole on uh, a number of issues and I had to sue them uh, to get redress, you know what I mean? Because that's the only thing you can do. I've done two documentaries with ITV about my son called Dylan's Legacy. I set up a charity called the Dylan O'Brien Foundation. Unfortunately, COVID had us, unfortunately, but we were supplying um, life-saving equipment to children and their families because they weren't available on the NHS. So, you know, yeah, I, I have been through the mill, but I, I'm also... A very positive person i try to take uh the positive out of the negative i think like when i went to prison i was a mess i was i was taking drugs i i never used to smoke before i went into prison never smoked a cigarette never mind anything else. and i was a mess and some of the birmingham six were inside the car bridge water was inside you know the wrong were wrongly convicted and proved later on they were the ones who helped me through my time at, at the beginning and told me how to get myself together. So let me really take you it. back, Michael, let me take you back to the very start of it. You know, let's go through in a fairly chronological order. Philip Saunders is murdered. What's the first you know about the police believing that you're involved? Well, on the night in question, I've got to be honest with you, I'm no angel. I want to, I want to stress that. But I, I, I wasn't no Ronnie Biggs either. You know, I was only I was out on a night in question, stealing the car with two other friends of mine. One of them was my brother-in-law, and one was a person I only met on the night in question, Darren Hall. Now, within five or ten minutes of me meeting Darren Hall, I knew there was something wrong with him. You know what I mean? In the sense, like, I, I, I would describe it as he wasn't a full shilling, you know, a few bricks short of a full load, because that was my vocabulary in those days. I, 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 you know, I learned to speak properly when I was in prison. But I, I learned about it when they knocked my door on the 1st of November. And they said, are you Michael O'Brien? And I said, yes. And they said, we're arresting you for the murder of Philip Saunders. And I can remember my exact words to the police officer, who the FNL is Philip Saunders. Didn't have a clue, you know, who they were talking about. You know, yes, I knew there was a murder in the city, but I didn't know who is. I didn't know him by name, and I didn't know who was responsible. So it came as a, as a really big shock to be conveyed into a police car to Canton Police Station, uh, where I was subjected to handcuffed. I was handcuffed to hot radiators. I was abused in the police station, and my human rights was a, you know, denial of access to lawyers, etc. I, I went through the. The mill, and it was it was an awful experience, and I don't think even now I, I don't think I could go through that again. So, Michael, let me just pause there a second, and uh, and let me just invite the our viewers, our, our listeners, just to engage. You know, if you've got a specific question that you want me to put to Michael, then please ask me. Michael is very open, and he's happy to answer anything. Uh, or if you've got something in relation to another miscarriage of justice case, in fact, Michael's case. You know, made history in terms of what he achieved and he's going to talk to me about that shortly but uh, what is your case that that sits with you what do you think is probably the biggest miscarriage of justice case drop me a line and let me know michael so you are now in custody uh, in relation to philip saunders murder a man you know nothing of it's a name that was suddenly given to you what happens then what happens in the interview well, they were trying to get me to confess. They were trying to get me to confess and implicate my co-accused, Ellis Sherwood. Unbeknown to me, Darren Hall was being interviewed in another room and he'd done 14 different statements. And he basically said that me and Ellis Sherwood murdered Philip Saunders while he was the lookout. But, you know, there was another 13 other different statements saying one minute he didn't do it, then he didn't know who done it. And there was a guy with ginger hair his name was Tony. You could clearly see this guy had psychological problems and didn't know what he was talking about. And he couldn't have done the murder. He was a very vulnerable person, Darren Hall, which I'll explain a bit more about as we go along. Unfortunately, 
at my trial, I did not know that Darren Hall had confessed to a crime he hadn't done before. And that was kept away from the defence. So, so Darren Hall had learning difficulties, did he? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I, I, I mean, um, I called him, I remember when I was in court, and I'm, this probably make a few people laugh in the seriousness of it all, I called him a bungalow because I didn't have a vocabulary. I was only 19. I come from a place called Ely. You know, I wasn't very well educated. And the judge said to me, what do you mean when you call him a bungalow? I said, well, he got fuck all upstairs. And the jury started laughing. But that was my best way. I'm not a psychologist. I wasn't a psychiatrist. But I just knew there was something wrong with the guy. And if I can pick that up, and I'm a 19-year-old who don't know much, surely the police who were trained in these matters would have known. And sadly, I found out later on they did know but they were so desperate to get a conviction. Um, we were the four guys. It was as simple as that. So, Michael, I'm interested in what evidence the police believe they had during the course of that interview that they put to you. Did you have a solicitor? I did have a solicitor, yes. But he didn't. I asked him to make a complaint because I was handcuffed to a hot radiator for long periods of time. They couldn't account for our whereabouts in the police station. Right. The police report, I don't know if you're aware of that, which... Uh, identified 115 breaches of the Police and Criminal mm. Evidence Act, which is shocking. You know, um, I didn't know my rights when I was 19. I did, I'd never really been in trouble. I was always on the periphery of, in, in, in you know, like with, with cars and stuff like that and with the boys trying to fit in and be one of the boys. You know, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And um, on, as I said, on a night in question, we were out trying to steal a car for joyriding purposes. and. Um, when I was in that police station, I told them this. To my statement, I did lie first of all because I was more concerned about the car being done for the car than I was for the for the murder because I knew I didn't do the murder. I knew. So I'd what did involved. they, Michael? What what did they accuse you of doing? What evidence did they have that they put to you that you were involved with Philip Saunders' murder? Darren Hall's evidence. Darren Hall my, is my right. coach. Yeah, yeah. You know, that we did it. Um, that's all I had at that stage, but they released us on bail pen, uh, pending further inquiries. We were released on the 3rd of November after a horrendous time in the police station where they denied us food and water, uh, denied us access to our lawyers, and um, we were freed on bail. I was so damaged by that, I ended mm. up in a mental hospital called Whitchurch in Cardiff because I was so damaged by the what they did in that three days. And so what happens after that? So you're, you're put on bail, you go home. What's the next thing that happens? Well, on the 10th of November then, we got another knock on the door. We're arresting you. We got new evidence. So, you know, that you killed Philip Saunders. So you can imagine my, you know, I was horrified, like, you know, being taken to the police station again. I thought, oh, here we go again. I'm going to get more grief now. What are they going to do to me? And I was scared. i got to be honest with you. I was only a kid. And I was scared out of my wits. I'd never been in the police station before this case, you know, so I didn't know what to expect. Um, but what evidence they had, they had a, a, a person called Christopher Chicken Helen Morris, who were in serious trouble with the police at the time, but I didn't know this. And they reckon they seen me and Ellis in town spending money a couple of days later in town, spending money from the robbery. But there's only one problem with that. Ellis Sherwood was locked up on the night he said that he saw us, uh, he was in the magistrate's court. He didn't get released till later on the next day, yet they still took his evidence in chief. So let's just pop that picture back up. So I've got uh, my producer, uh, Jody, uh, who's going to help us. So just tell me, who's that? That's Ellis Sherwood, and that's me when I first come out. That was my first pint in uh, the Ely Bridge pub uh, in, in my hometown in Cardiff. Right. And we'll get to that very shortly. But you are then... Uh, charged and you go to trial are, are you of the opinion this just hasn't got any legs to go you know this just just won't happen we're going to be freed well there was another significant piece of evidence that happened on the second arrest while we were in the police station a police officer alleges that me and ellis sherwood uh made up a you know made a confession uh, we were talking to each other and it was an incriminating, converse, uh, incriminating conversation. That conversation was a total fabrication. So he but just he made to, it up? He did, he did make it up. I said to him that I was scared about my wife was in the, the police station because she was heavily pregnant with my daughter. It was eight months, the one I lost. And um, what actually happened then was they went, um, 
or telling the truth, Ellis. You know what I mean? I don't know what's happening. Being on remand means nothing. Or, well, if you don't tell him, I'm going to tell him. You know, shut your mouth. It's only all and grassiness. You know, and the confession went something like that. Now, I, I knew then, when they put that confession to me at 11 o'clock on the 10th of November, I knew they were framing me and there was nothing I could do. And that was what did your time. solicitor say to that? Well, my solicitor knew he had, he had a previous client where this police officer had done the same before. And I wanted to bring it up in court. Okay. And when I went to court, he said to me, don't bring it up. And I, and I said, no, I'm bringing it up. And there was another guy on remand with me as well called Hydem Huck. And I believe he was wrongly convicted of, the, of an ice cream uh, an arson attack. I want, to have a, I, want, I want to chat about South Wales Police in particular shortly because there have obviously a number of uh, investigations into the, you know, the corruption that exists, existed at the time in South Wales Police Force. But let's just park that for now. So they okay. get a piece of evidence that they fabricate. Yes. They use that to bring a charge against you. Just give me a sense of, of how you're feeling on the eve of the trial. Suicidal. I, I just didn't think this things like this happened. I always believed in the police, to be honest. You know, even though I was on the periphery of things, you know, some of my mates used to say to me, oh, the police are trying to frame me for this. And I used to say, oh, there's no smoke without fire. You must be doing something, you know? And, and I was that naive. And then here I was, seeing from, with my own eyes, that I was being framed or alleged, you know, uh, attempted to be framed at that stage. So I wasn't found guilty. But um, I asked my lawyers, what do you think is going to happen with the case? And he said to me, if Darren all goes in the witness box and says what he said in his statement, you, you, you're doomed. You're going down. And that sent shivers down my spine. Uh, I mean... Michael, whilst my, you were on remand, and I alluded to it in the opening tragedy happened within your family do you mind talking about it yes my daughter kylie was born on the 21st of december 1988 uh, my wife was heavily pregnant when i went in and that was the only thing keeping me going i, I also had a one-year-old son called kyle as well before i went in i was a family man and you know tried to make ends meet it was difficult but um my daughter died uh, on the march march the third she died of a cot death, and the way they told me, the prison authorities, was absolutely appalling. What happened was I had a, a priest called Martin Kiddle, and I put it in my book. I've mentioned it. Um, he came over to me and said, i got a special visit for you. So me thinking like I was, thinking, oh, he must have found some new evidence of my solicitor. But then my solicitor said to me, I think you better sit down, Mike. And then he told me that my daughter had died that morning. Mm. Well, I just wanted to... Well, I just don't know what I, I, I can't describe it. I don't think there's anything in the, in the English dictionary which could describe the pain I was feeling at that particular time. Here I was, you know, my wife then walked out on me a couple of weeks after that because she couldn't cope. She was only 18. So mm -hmm. I'd lost everything. You know, I'd lost everything, really. You know, well, I'm so sorry to hear that. And, um, you know, uh, well, horrific horrific so you're in you're in uh, court you're on trial how does that go i mean having taken many people to court and sat through court it's always a very difficult one to you know to judge which way things are going did you did you have hope did you think do you know what i'm gonna this is gonna the truth's gonna come through and, and i'm going to walk out of this place or did you think i didn't you know think they convicted guilt, uh, innocent people i thought only guilty right. people I was so I still had that, you know, that mantra where I thought innocent people don't go to prison. I thought I was the only innocent mm -hmm. person in prison. You know, this is how naive I was and stupid I was at 19. Uh, I could kick myself now when I look back, you know, but that's how naive I was. And I think unless you have dealings with the police and all that, um, it's very difficult to, you know, see something like this coming. And I, 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 I never seen this coming at all. But I, I do remember when I was found guilty on the 20th of July and they, the judge said, you've had every opportunity through your, yourself and your barristers to put your case. And in my view, you've been rightly found guilty. I'll never forget really? that day as long as you I was crying my eyes out. I said to my father, 
Dad, as long as you know I never done it, that's what matters. And I had to hold on to the, you know, the railings because my, my legs nearly buckled underneath me. And he said, it's only so one sentence. Unanimous, you. Michael, unanimous verdict? No, it was a 10 to 2, believe it or not. It was two a majority. Jury, yeah, there was two jury members who believed me and believed that Darren Hall was lying. Right. Extraordinary when you think about it. When he went in the witness box and said, well, you know, I was the lookout and they done it and... Um, why, well, just help me understand slightly, and and our listeners to understand why. What was it? What was the benefit for Darren Hall to admit to it? Well, that, Darren's a complex character. I didn't know this at the time because I only met him on the Monday, the same night that the murder happened. He happened to go down my sister-in-law's house, which was Ellis Sherwood's sister, and I believe the guy who was with Martin. Uh, with that with Darren Hall was a friend of Mandy Pasigo's. So when we went down there that night, that's the first time I'd even set eyes on the guy. But as I said, I knew within five or ten minutes this guy was a fantasizer. I knew there was something not wrong with him. How could the police didn't find that out? How didn't the police know this? They must have known. Michael, first night in jail. How was that? Where, where did you go? Just, where did you go? I went to, I went to Cardiff Prison and I, and I was suicidal. Okay. I remember being put in a strip cell as well because um, I told him how I felt. I, I was just being me and being honest. And for my troubles, I was put in a cell with um, just a, a bucket to have a wee and, you know, and, and urinating and everything like that. I had, a, I had a mattress on the floor and I had nothing in the cell. That just made me even more depressed. Um, mm. I don't know whether them practices still go on now, but they were very callous, quite frankly. Um, and it was, it was awful. It was awful. And one of our uh, viewers has asked, what was the worst thing about being in prison when you knew you were innocent? Knowing you were innocent and knowing that I shouldn't have been there and I should be with my family. Uh, you know, I was ripped away from my family, you know, my children and, I couldn't be there for my wife when my my daughter had died. I mean, that was the hardest part. I went to my daughter's funeral in handcuffs, double handcuffs, you know. And I mean, that was horrendous in itself. Um, and when I how, how did you coffee, get treated in how did you get treated in jail, Michael? I mean, obviously, you know, I've I've visited a lot of people in jail, and people come out of jail and talk about all kinds of different stories. How did you face it? Did you did you end up in trouble? Did people? Get on to well, you. How was it in the, in the early years when I first went? You know, when I got when I got sentenced and I got moved to Long Latin, uh, that's when my problem started because I went back to Cardiff Prison in '96 when my father died, or '97, sorry, and I got treated quite badly by the prison officers because by then I'd educated myself. I took the Home Secretary to court. I won my case against the prison authorities and the governor of Long Latin Prison. And I got, I, I was known as the prison lawyer. I used to do all the stuff for the inmates when they were on charges against, you know, the system, uh, against, uh, in front of the governor, the adjudications. And I won some notable cases. And um, I think they seen me as a problem. They were scared of me. So they put me down the block uh, because they said I refused to squat. In other words, they wanted to look, look at my anal mm. passage to see if I had any drugs. Now, there was no cause for them. They were supposed to have reasonable cause. They didn't have no cause. And one of the prison officers was from Long Latin, Officer Evans. I'll never forget him. And he threw all my clothes on the floor. And he wanted me to retaliate. I thought, I'm not going to bite. You talked about some of the support that you got when you went in initially. You, the Carl Bridgewater. I think you named a number of other people. Who were they and what support did they give you? Well, I was on self I, went in there. I, I, I got to be honest with you, From I got along Latin in 1989. I was introduced to a bit of cannabis. You know, I, I didn't even know what cannabis was. I was so naive. Uh, and then I started with Coke and then I started on other things, you know, the amphetamines. In, in jail, was, openly available in jail? I was smashed from 2007. For the first year, I didn't know where I was. And I collapsed in my cell one day. And I realized I needed help. And I went down to see the psychologist and I said, listen. And that's just, that, to... that's, that's prisoners, that's prisoners, friends or relatives bringing it in. Or is it prison officers? I mean, how's it getting in? 
Well, you know, you uh, well, I done a book on uh, prisons called Prisons Exposed, and, and and in there, I have there's a number of prison officers who used to bring their drugs. In. I mean, the families cannot bring in 1.1 million worth of drugs or mobile phones through the visiting with all the cameras there. So it has to come from the prison officers. And a number of prison officers I identified went to prison for bringing in drugs. So it, most right. of it did come in that way. Definitely. It wasn't the families, although the families and the prisoners' families get the blame all the so time. You, so available, whilst you were in jail, available in there was uh, cocaine, cannabis, what else? Well, you you could basically get whatever you wanted. You could basically and get how, whatever what's you wanted. The, you know, if you, what's the currency in jail? How does that work? Well, in the old days, it was like phone cards or tobacco, you know, things like that. You know, um, I don't know. We, we used to get paid in money at the time as well when I was in Long Latin. We used to get paid in 50 pence pieces all, all those years ago. Uh, you'd only allowed so much in your possession at one time. But you could... You know, you could use that. And what was the benefit for the prison officers? So, I mean, is, is they're giving it presumably to somebody who's the big cheese inside. Well, I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand why, you know, that, that went on, you know, at all. Like, you know, I, I, uh, I seen it going on, but, you know, you couldn't get involved. You know what I mean? Because that was more than what your life was worth. You know, you just kept out of it, like. Um, the, the old saying is when when you're in prison, you don't see nothing, you know. I mean, I seen a couple of murders. So, so was I well. mean, was this a racket being run by a big cheese within the jail that had prison officers uh, at their beck and call, or, or was it the prison? Sorry, prison. Uh, yeah, prison officers were providing it for inmates because they were getting some kind of kickback. How did that system work? Well, I'll give an example. There was a prison officer in Long Latin, right? When we used to get paid in 50 pence pieces, people used to smuggle in money and then change it up. But they used to change it up. If you give me a £10 note, I'll give you £7 in 50 pence pieces. And he was making £3 a time on the tenner. Now, he paid off his mortgage. He was in the Sunday people because they caught him. They marked up a £10 note and they caught him at the prison gate with that £10 note, which, which was, you know, it was a setup. And he paid off his uh, mortgage, and although he lost his job, he was never charged with anything. Yet there, there's a number of prison officers like that who do, do things. It's just how do you catch them? And tell me about some of the characters you met in prison. Oh, I met some all weird and wonderful. I mean, I met Charlie Bronson. I got to be honest with you. Um, Did you speak to him? To speak to Charlie? Yeah, he, I wrote about him in my book, The Death of Justice. Yeah, I, Charlie spoke up for me. Um, one of the prison officers was trying to bully me, and Charlie went in there and said, "If you got a problem with him," and I was only a little skinny thing. I was only about eight stone, something like that. Charlie was this big lump, and he went in and he said, "You, you, you touch him, you got me to deal with." And they went, "All right, Charlie." I'm like, "No, no, no, no," you know. And I thanked him for that. You know what I mean? Because he did stick up for me. He was a cons con, you know. And I want to, you know, the myths in the paper, uh, he's this most dangerous person. I know he's done some crazy things, but he is not a murderer. And he gets treated worse than a sex offender. And I find that really, really offensive. You know what I mean? When you consider he never killed anyone. Yes, he's done things. He's taken people hostage. You know the full story behind it. It's only the people in prison who know the story. When he took a governor hostage, he asked for a helicopter and an ice cream. Can you really take the guy serious? If he wanted to hurt that governor, believe me, he could have hurt that governor. He could. What about <laughs> what about yeah. other characters other than Bronson? Well, I'm I'm I met Jeremy Bamber. In, we in met Jeremy. Yeah, I know Jeremy, and I, I believe yeah. he's a victim of a miscarriage of justice. That's yeah, well, I, so do I. I don't know if you've seen any of my coverage, but um, yes, and actually, I have. we've I, done I, we've done a um, and in fact, I don't know if you're able to pull this up uh jody but we've done a, an investigation three-part investigation for news quest which is on our youtube channel about the jeremy bamber investigation case and, and i actually absolutely believe he is innocent and, and like you but give me your sense why well I, I tell you why i met him in long latin he was on the same wing as me he was on d wing in long latin he was about three doors away from me and when he come in he was having a hard time you can imagine some of the prisoners didn't take too kindly to the crime he was alleged to have committed. And I, I remember 
reading some of the documents he had, like on the ballistic testing and all that. And he always protested his innocence. All he wanted to talk about, he was like me, obsessed with the case. Yeah, you know and, and, he, that... and he'd sit in his jail, of course, wouldn't he? And here we are. You can see there now the uh, uh, the Jeremy Bamber investigation, which sets out you know, my view in terms of what took place. And, and he, you know, I've written to Jeremy and we've communicated on you know, a lot of times. And Jeremy has his, his you, know, you can see there, there's my name, dear Mark. And uh, his his letters, you know, his files, they make up his his room. Well, i got a lot of time for Jeremy Van, but for the simple fact is he's done so long and he's still there fighting. And it's difficult, you know, mentally, you know, to fight a miscarriage of justice yeah. case. Well, a life, he's, he's one of the few life lifers who will, who's been deemed by the Home Secretary. Uh, and as a result of that will, unless, of course, his conviction is quashed, will never be released. Well, I, I think that's another issue because I don't think that's right, you know, to be honest. I think that's a, another human rights. I think, I think um, whether it's just a dog guilty, you've got to give them some hope. I mean, to cut somebody off like that. But with Jeremy, I know he's got, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm a patron of his chat, of his organisation, you know what I mean, set up for him, the Jeremy Bamba campaign. I'm in contact with uh, Yvonne and many other people. I yep. speak at some of their events. And I, I even took Jeremy's T-shirt to Armenia with me when I went over uh, on the British Horizons and they were asking me about miscarriages of justices when I went on the TV show and I had um, free Jeremy Bamba, 30 years wrongfully in prison. And the host Mike, was I, just, I want to take you back to the case and I want to take you back to something you've just mentioned, which was regards to the Home Secretary. Now, journalists, uh, you know, myself included, you know, we often engage with prisoners, prisoners who maintain their innocence. And you know, I have to say yeah. the large majority of, of people in jail you know, who maintain their innocence are actually guilty. But there is a small number. There is a very small number who absolutely should not be in jail. And the system prevents them from getting access. I mean, I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've tried to get access to Jeremy uh, through the Ministry of Justice, uh, and it just is not being allowed. You had a victory in that, didn't you? For you, I did. In, I did indeed. It was in uh, 1995 when the BBC Week in Week Out team, which is like the Welsh Panorama program. Yes, I know them uh, well. Yeah, I've done a, a, a big investigation into my case, and. Karen Voicey, the producer, came up to visit me. And as soon as they found out she was a journalist, they decided that she had to sign a disclaimer to say she wouldn't disclose anything. She refused to do it. And it was from that moment on, Article 10 was engaged. And I said to the governor, if you refuse for this woman to see me and you interfere with me trying to prove my innocence, I will take you to court. And so I think Art thought that, Article yeah, 10 is, is what, Michael? The right to free speech. Yeah. Okay. Right. If we, sorry, I should I should have been more clear on that. No, don't right. worry. Because of course, one of the issues that it, it is a criminal offence for a journalist to go to jail um, and to interview. Uh, and in fact, there we've put up pulled up there uh, interviewings of of individuals in jail. And, that, and I think that's your your uh, BBC article that talks in terms of how successful you've been. Which Home Secretary was that? Well, I was lucky to have the two of them, you know what I mean? I was glad to get one of them. But what happened was the Labour government was in, uh, no, sorry, the Conservative and it went to the High Court and I won it there against Michael Howard. Okay. Then the, in 97, the Labour government come in under Tony Blair and his Blairites and all that. That's another matter. But um, And he come in and Jack Straw was the um, Home okay. Secretary and he appealed against it to the appeal courts. He won it back, but I said, well, okay, I'll go to the House of... But for me, I was already released on bail pending my appeal because, you know, the new evidence was already shown on the TV, thankfully. We could, did manage to get it out there. But while I was out, I realised the importance of all the other prisoners left behind. I could have walked away from this and said, well, I don't want to take it no further. So I decided that I had to take the case further for those who were left behind. And I hope the judgment would have helped other innocent people to gain access to journalists. Because I, I have had stories recently that uh, the Ministry of Justice and what they're doing is unlawful. 
you know, on one case, I've been told they only allow you one journalist. No, no, that's not what the Lord Stein said at the House of Lords. The, the law is quite clear. If somebody is protesting their innocence and have been doing it for so long, for, for a long period, they are entitled to speak to a journalist of their choosing and as many as they want. You know what I mean? Now, so how do I get how do I mind. how do I get Jeremy access to Jeremy to talk to me then? You would have you'd probably have to put in to see him, and if they refused it, you would have to judicially review it. Yeah. That's the only option you would have. Uh and, and quote my judgment and say, Well, yeah. the House of Lords said that they, you know. Mr. O'Brien can do this. Why can't Jeremy? He's exactly the same as me. Yeah. There's no difference. Let me take you back to the case. So uh, the case was reviewed. Uh, you, this is your conviction. And uh, I'm just going to just go through some of the issues that came off it. So police officers had threatened and coerced key witnesses into providing and giving false evidence. Named key civilian witnesses had purged themselves at the trial by providing false evidence. Detective Inspector Stuart... Lewis, now retired, had prevented the course, perverted the course of justice by fabricating an overheard cell conversation, which is obviously what you talked about just now. Lewis had purged himself by presenting the fabricated evidence against O'Brien and Sherwood at the trial. What else did they find out? Well, while we were on remand, a number of prisoners come forward and said we confessed to them. Uh, I mean, I... I know you've been involved in miscarriages for a while as well, and you know miscarriages just cases. When they're using ex-prisoners or prisoners, the script in the bottom of the world. all these witnesses were in serious trouble with the police, and one of them was on Rule 43. And just to explain that, a Rule 43 prisoner is kept away from all the other prisoners, segregated. So how can we confess to somebody we can't we haven't even got access to? Yet that they, they, you know. And a prison officer give false evidence against us, a guy called Peter Davis. I, I remember that. You know, he said uh, Darren Hall confessed to him. And Darren Hall never said anything. He did say, no, I didn't talk to this prison officer. But there was another confession found on the back of a statement when they did an investigation. And there was a confession, allegedly, from this same prison officer, from me and Ellis, but it wasn't signed. So I was quite... Um, but... The prison officer was seen about that and he said he didn't know anything about it. Well, who did it then? So, so this is cell this confessions is the... are very sorry, Michael. Uh, cell confessions uh, are very interesting. In fact, we've got the recent case. If, if Jody, you're able to pick it up, this is the case of a well, very high profile prisoner, which is Belfield. Um, yeah, Levi Belfield, who is, of course, uh, is alleged to have done a cell confession in relation to the. Um, Chillenden murders and though the individual in jail for the Chillenden murders is Michael Stone and the Chillenden murders, murders happened in 1996 that's Lynn and Megan Russell do you know a bit about that Michael? Well I, I know for a fact that Michael Stone is innocent you know there's no doubt about it I know I know his sister Barbara I've worked with her I highlighted the case when I first come out uh, I, I understand about the confession and but from what I can gather Belfield have said things which only the real killer would have known because the, the police didn't release certain things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there is some uniqueness to some of the stuff that, yes. that is alleged. So there is confessions. Said. You know, but with my co accused and all like the Birmingham Six and all that, it the, the facts doesn't tie into what that person's confession, you know, the confession and the evidence at the hmm. murder scene, say, for instance. Like Darren Hall said, he, you know, we killed him with a house brick. Well, we all know he was. If you confess to something you've done, why say he was with a shovel or with a house brick? It just shows you did he didn't have a clue. So there is identifiers to show where there is a false confession and when there's not a false confession. So you you know it's a balancing act again, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So Jamil, let me bring you in. Jamil, you've got a question uh, from. In fact, quite a few questions coming in, but uh, tell me the latest question you've got. Hi, Michael. So we've got a question Hi. from our Facebook user who asks, did you speak to other prisoners about what had happened? Did other prisoners believe you were innocent? Yes, I did. Uh, I'll give you a couple of names. They've all had their names cleared now. George Long, done, done uh, 15 years. Peter Fell, done 17 years. You know, some of the Guildford Four were there as well, or Birmingham Six, sorry. 
Uh, the Calbridge Water, who were wrongly convicted, I was in prison with them. The Cardiff Three. I mean, we all used to congregate together in, in Long Latin. There was a number of us fighting the cases. And I don't know whether you're aware, in 92, I coordinated one of the biggest hunger strikes in the prison system when, when there was 20 prisoners protesting their innocence in one prison, and there were 15 in another one, and it's the first time it was thought the prisoners have got together and refused their Christmas meals. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it was followed up with the Radio 4 programme. So, Michael, yeah, you've, done some, to... you've done some sterling yeah. stuff in jail and, and obviously since in relation to your case and other people's cases. Just give me a sense of your feeling when you finally are acquitted and you're finally, you know, that, that veil of, of um, guilt, that veil of, you know, everyone thinking, you know, he's a convicted killer is finally lifted. What did that mean for you? It was such a big relief, but I was so angry when I come out. I was so damaged. Are you angry now? No, I got rid of all my bitterness a number of years ago. I mean, when I lost my son, Dylan, it made me reevaluate my life. I had two choices. I could sink or swim. And i got to be honest with you, when I lost my son, Dylan, it nearly killed me. I thought I was mm. finished. I didn't think I was going to get up off the floor. But by Christ, I did. And thank God I did. You know, I wouldn't be able to help as many people that I'm trying to help today. Um, I learned to live with what's happened and there's always hope. And, and, and this is what I try and put across to people who were in prison as well. You know, yes, this is a long process to get people innocent out, but I'm sitting here now talking to you because I fought to get out. And my advice to a lot of innocent people is you've got to take the bull by the horns. You've got to start writing to people. You've got to engage with your campaigners. It isn't one of the, the problems... Lead. Michael, isn't one of the problems in jail is the literacy and the understanding of individuals in jail in terms of being able then to mount their own defence? I mean, I, you know that I do some miscarriage of justice cases. But one of the things that always saddens me so much is that you know, once the criminal justice system has put you behind bars, it is a massive, massive uphill battle. And, and actually, you've got to have the resources in some capacity. That's either financially yourself or the resources and the, the intelligence yourself to be able to take the authorities on. That's not easy. Well, I'll just tell you a little bit about my situation. I couldn't read or write properly when I went into prison. And I, um, when I got off the drugs and I got all the anger out of me, you know, and I was angry. That's what I think that's what kept me going more than anything. Uh, I went on education classes. Do you know what I mean? I took English exams. I passed uh, level one, two, and three RSA. I went on maths. I done uh, level one, two, and three. I got a city and guilds behind me. Uh, I, and I've continued that since I've come out. I've got A levels in law. I've gone to university twice. Uh, and I never stopped. I mean, sometimes in prison, you might have facilities. Uh, you've got to use the, what you've got. And that's what I did. And I grasped it. And I learned to talk properly because uh, I can remember the police taking the mickey because I used to say, like, you know, oh, use lot, uh, useless. You know, and I used to take the mickey because of the way I spoke. But I, I learned how to talk properly. I, I, I surrounded myself with the right people, the innocent people. Michael Shirley was another one who'd done 15 years. Uh, so tell me, tell me about yeah. Let's talk about a couple of other cases before we move on to you know, the final part of your you know your life to date. Really, what other cases? So we've talked about Jeremy Bamber, and we've just talked about Michael Stone. But what other cases are the high profile uh, miscarriage cases have, have you had either dealings with since or or met the individuals in jail? Well, there's, there's a high profile one in Wales uh, called the Merthyr Three. They were wrongly convicted of killing uh, a woman and her two children by arson. They set that, so allegedly set the house on fire. And Let's see if we can them, try and pull that case up, Jamie. Yeah, her name's the... Annette, Hewin, Annette Hewins, Donna Clark, and Denise Sullivan. And two of them had their convictions, well, they all had their convictions quashed, but they like, you know, they tried to muddy the waters by leaving it on fire. And with Denise, they said that they gave Donna an alibi, Donna Clark, who was supposed to have started the fire. And Ed Hewins was supposed to have supplied the petrol to Donna Clark to set the fire alight. And right. my research, and in my book, The Dossier, which is uh, all of his carriages from 1982 to 2016, about um, what has happened in Wales, and you can see the pattern clearly 
what's going on here. I felt I, there was a forensic guy was Sati Seeker, who's a good friend of ours, uh, done a bit of research and went to this forensic guy and said, what started the fire? Was it leaded or unleaded? And he said it was one or the other. You know, he said what it was, like leaded. Now, Annette Ewins was seen on camera putting in, un, you know, the other petrol into the car, which was not the one which started the fire. So the notion that the prosecution was saying, like, well, Annette supplied Donna with the petrol was disproved. And the forensic guy said this in a private meeting uh, after the, the other two got acquitted. But Denise has still got the perverting the course of justice um, against her. And I'm trying to get the case reopened. I mean, I've just got it in Take a Break magazine this month. There's stories in there. I've managed to get it in a number of newspapers in Wales. There's a mini documentary on the radio, hopefully going to be made. Uh, and I'm involved in that one. Uh, terrible case. And I, I want to say this. I do feel for the victim's family in this particular case. Mm. Well, in all, all the cases, you know. I yeah, mean, I mean, I we, think we mustn't forget them. Mike, no, let's know? talk about them in a minute. I just want to finish on. Yeah. So, so you've obviously published this book dossier. How do people get hold of it? And just give us a sense in a snapshot of what you talk about and, and what cases it covers. Well, it, it covers the Jonathan Jones case. It covers the Darvell brothers, which is a well-known case. Again, confessions by South Wales police. You're looking at the Cardiff three case, the Lynette White case. You're looking at there's some unknown cases in there, which I found, uh, you know, um, um, I'm just trying to think now, uh, Mr. Moore in there. There's a, there's so many in there. I think it's about 14 different cases altogether, but there's five high profile. And an interesting one is called the Welsh Conspiracy case, where the police tried to frame Lord Ellis Thomas, the presiding officer of the Welsh Assembly, by offering some of the defendants... This, this is that Stuart Lewis again, mind, when he was involved in my case, he was involved in that one, and offered him £10,000 to implicate him in the holiday home bombings. I don't know if you can recall him in 1984, uh, 1980s, sorry. You know, and uh, that was a, that case helped me on my appeal because, again, it was confessions by the, like, um, Nicholas Hodges, who was one of the defendants, but the police put the pressure on him like they did Darren Hall, and they were all acquitted. And only one conclusion you can draw from that acquittal was that the police had lied. So the police knew and the Home Office knew in 1982 that this copper, uh, Stuart Lewis, was making up these confessions as early as 82. And that, that's very worrying. And that was what very about high the, the, uh, Let's just check the dossier. I think, um, Jamil, you're just going to let us know where people can get hold of that uh, book from? Yeah, it's from Siren. Or from Amazon. Is that helpful? Yep, that title is available on Amazon. I think that's the easiest option for everyone. Um, but uh, all Waterstones, uh, Serene Books. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Jamil. So Thank South Wales Police, uh, I mean, they have had some big corruption issues, haven't they, in terms of uh, the force. What went wrong? I think there's no accountability. I think this is what's gone wrong because if they would have nipped it in the bud in the early years, like, you know, I could prove in 1982 they could have stopped this. I, I went to the um, Lord Ellis Thomas, give me access to all his case papers uh, to do with the Welsh conspiracy case. And there was a letter in that bundle which said that there was a police officer who come forward who wanted to tell the truth about what these police, bad police officers were doing. But, and all he asked for was protection for him and his family. The Home Office refused to do it. So he didn't come forward. And that, and that was done via the Lord Ellis Thomas. Right. So, I mean, that's shocking. If they can try and frame a member of Parliament, as he was at the time, he was a member of, I think he was for Kenadigion or something like that. I can't be 100% sure, but I know he was from one of the Welsh regions. And what they tried to do to this bloke uh, was just shocking because... I didn't have a chance, but if you can try and frame an MP, yes, are any of us really. safe? Yeah. So you come out of jail and you start to rebuild your life. How was that? I mean, you're in jail for a long time. I think you did you do 11 years in jail? Was that right? And the longest Welsh serving prisoner in Wales, yes. I did what was it years. like starting again? I mean, you were a kid, you were, you were a teenager when you went in. You were, you were on the, the cusp of being a, you're an adult. 
it was very difficult. I mean, when I first come out, I didn't have no money. I mean, it was a couple of days before Christmas. That was brilliant, you know, in the sense like my son was 13 years of age at the time when I come out, Kyle. And, you know, I stayed up talking until four o'clock in the morning. Uh, that was brilliant, you know, I'm being with my mother and my sister Sue. My sister Sue Beans, you know, played a big part in getting me out. You know what I mean? She gave up a career for me. She could have gone to Canada and um, had, a, had, a, had a top job, but she just didn't want to leave me behind. And I gotta, gotta, I'd like to thank her now if that's okay. Uh, she'd probably be a bit embarrassed, but I mean, she, she, she was, uh, my, you know, my sister Susan and my mother Marlene. Wow. What, there's another high profile case in South Wales Police, and that is the murder of Karen Price. Did, did you have any knowledge or involvement in that case? Yes, I did. I, I helped the lawyers in Manchester, who I believe. Just, just give uh, us the, sorry, Michael, just give us the, the background to that story. Well, Karen Price was a woman who was found dead, um, rolled up in the carpet, if I remember, yeah. In, yeah. In, in the back garden. Now, Alan Charlton and Idris Ali was accused of that murder. And the case was referred by the CCRC uh, a couple of years ago. And I've had talks with the CCRC and they can't believe that this case wasn't overturned. Uh, and it should have been overturned because the police malpractice in that case was just as bad as what it was in my case. Unfortunately, I believe um, one of the defendants has, has, you know, has died. So there's only Alan Charlton, but he's done, I think he's done about 30 years now. I'm but the, there is a link between the Karen Price case and your case, the, the murder. Yeah, of same coppers, Saunders. same police officers. Same officers, yeah. same officers. Yeah, yeah, same as in the Cardiff Three. There's a couple there. Yeah. Uh, there's the same in the Welsh Conspiracy case. The, you know, if you look at the dossier, you can see the pattern. It's not only just a, uh, it's not only just the barris, um It's not only just um, the police. You just see the same barristers popping up, the same solicitors popping up. The same, you know, the same junior councils popping up, and I just think something's not right here. Something, and of course, we wrong. We have those two cases, but we also have Lynette White, don't we? Well, sadly, we lost Tony Paris this year. I, I don't know whether you're aware of that, um, Mark, but Tony Paris passed away, you know, at, at sixty-five, and uh, that was a tr one of the biggest miscarriages in Wales, I would say. Um, as well as my own, like, you know what I mean? I mean, I was in 1987 when I went into prison. They were in 88. So it was only a year apart. And I I, know, I knew Tony well, and um, I knew Yusuf Abdullahi as well. You know, he died as well. That's, there's not many left in the Cardiff Five. I, Should we I just, let's just give the background to Lynette White. So I'm just going just to read it here. Is that So she was murdered on the 14th of February, 1988 in Cardiff. A photo fit image was issued of a bloodstained white male seen in the vicinity at the time of the murder, but they were unable to trace the men. And then in November 1988, the police charged five black and mixed race men with white murder, although none of the scientific evidence discovered at the crime scene could be linked to them. It became one of the longest uh, case trials and yes. they were sentenced to life imprisonment. And then in December 92, their convictions were ruled unsafe and quashed by the Court of Appeal. Same police officers in South Wales Police that dealt with your case. I mean, there's an extra strand to this, a, a potentially, you know, a racist element to it? I think there is, I, you know, especially with the Cardiff 3 case. Uh, there's also another element which nobody's picked up on. It's the confessions of the Darvell brothers our case and the Cardiff Three all share that same hallmark. They had a vulnerable co accused in each and every case, and they built right. the case around that vulnerable co accused. Yeah, easily done, easily done. You know, the police forces, this is pre pace. So those people you know, obviously are not aware or new to policing. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984 brought in very, very strict rules in terms of how evidence was gathered. Uh, and obviously, you know, we then later had police recordings, you know, interviews recorded. But prior to that, it was, you know, records made on a, a you know, a notebook or a, a piece of paper and, uh, you know, <coughs> submitted by the police as being, you know, what has been actually said. But of course, there was no record of that. So police officers quite easily make it up. And as is 
what you've said yourself. You know, that, that police officer made up, Lewis made up an account that was alleged to have come between the two of you, which was fabricated. Well, the worst thing about that is that he'd been doing it for years. He'd done it three and other cases. I could was he ever, was he prosecuted? It. No, he got away with it. He, he, he had bad health, I know that. Uh, but they said there wasn't enough evidence. Well, I mean, my book, The Dossier, proves there is enough evidence. Mm. Anthony the Yellen case, the Sharon Kelleher case, an ex-police officer come forward and said that Stuart Lewis tried to get her to make uh, incriminating remarks into her, uh, into her statements, and she refused to do it. They ousted her out of the force, and she died a couple of years ago. Her name was Margaret Young. I mean, Michael, was... I'm I'm pushing towards the last few minutes, but there's a, a one thing I want to ask you about is is the victims. You know, we, we mustn't lose sight that in each and every murder and each and every miscarriage of justice case, there are victims. Uh, there's victims' families, and for many of those, you know, they were led to believe that those people who went to jail were responsible, and then, of course, in your case, acquitted. What happened? In relation to Philip Saunders, has anybody been brought to justice for that? No, but I did do a documentary in May of this year, uh, last year, with Raphael Rowe called um, British Injustice, where I met the victim's family, which is very unheard of. I don't think it's ever yes. been done before. And they, they said to me, they knew well, I was what we would refer to as restorative justice. Yes. And, and, and that went out live, you know, on Sky TV. And it's still online if people want to see it. And it was a moving, it was moving for both of us because I felt for them and they felt for me. But you know, I know we haven't got long left, but I, I do know another case where the victim's family uh, uh, are campaigning for somebody, and it's, it's the case of Jason Moore. Uh, I mean, tell me about that case. Brutally, to, well, he was brutally murdered um, by by somebody I don't know who, uh, but. More, um, I can't say too much about it because you, you're already doing a podcast on it. I don't know whether you're aware that um, there's something going on behind the scenes and new evidence has come to light. Yes. But what I can tell you is the evidence they used to convict Jason Moore was appalling. I mean, the pathologist was struck off, and um, yes. the General Medical Council uh, had him had him uh, struck off over a number of cases, and yet his evidence was still allowed to be used uh, as the evidence of truth and went to the jury. I mean, that's a very worrying case for me, which I'm looking at now. No, um, I mean, it's a case that it's a case that one of my colleagues is currently looking at, and in due course, it will be the form of a podcast, and, and obviously we'll keep you up to date with that. Michael, as we move towards the last few minutes, I just want to get a sense from you in terms of where we are with the criminal justice system at the moment, where we are with the judiciary, the um, process in terms of people going to jail uh, and just some very quick answers really do you think there are people in jail a lot of people in jail you shouldn't be i think there's over a thousand easy yeah most definitely do you think, do you think the criminal justice system uh, is fit do you think it makes the right decisions it's not fit for its intended purpose if i may say i mean until we get accountability, and I said this to somebody the other night on Twitter, until we get accountability for the wrongdoings which have happened in these cases, it, it allows the, the abusers to carry on doing it because they know the system is going to stick up for them or pension them off or retire them so they don't well, get done for wrongdoing. Do you well, know there's only, quick... three police, there's only three, Sorry, police no, officers, three police officers have been done for perverting the cause of justice in miscarriages of justice cases. Do you know the statistics? From 89, uh, since the Guildford 4 story broke, 85,000 successful appeals have come about, and yet only three police officers have been brought to book. That's that's, a, that's, a sh that's an incredible number. 84,000 appeals. Yeah, that comes from the Innocence Project, yes. So, uh, most and of how, many of those, cases. how many of those are then successful? 85,000 successful appeals. Oh, so they, they were a success, success? They were successful appeals since 1989. It's probably Gosh. more now because these this data that I've got is like 2010. So it's probably maybe even more now. That, but a lot of these are mundane number. cases. Well, yeah, you know, it's all on, on, on the Bristol Innocence Project website. You can see all that. Um, you know, that's all on there. But um, if I can, I just wanted to mention quickly, if I could, 
the case of Mark Osborne because I promised him I'd try and yeah, do. mention do. it. Now, M- Mark Osborne's case, right, the only evidence against him, again, it was done for murder, but the problem we've got is a cellmate. That's the only evidence against him. So it's a cellmate seven- confession. It was a cellmate confession, right? He was in serious trouble with the police. He had 13 aliases, you know what I mean? Uh, and he was facing deportation. Mm-hmm. They've stopped the deportation. And even at one stage, he set, made a statement to say that the police were bullying him and put pressure to give evidence against, uh, you know, Mark Osborne. And that really concerns me. Also, M- Mark Osborne was in prison when this crime was actually committed. So where did the joint enterprise come from? I mean, it's unbelievable case. And I do hope people will, you know, look up, uh, you know, we need some of these petitions signed, like, you know what I mean, for Mark and for, you know, um, Jason. Can I mention, uh, the, the, if, if I may? Uh, yeah, do carry uh, on. For Jason, it's www.changeorg.freejasonmore. You know, uh, uh, please sign the petition. I, I, I beg you to sign it. We, they, we need their help. And the other one for, for Mark Osborne, it's www.changeorg free Mark William Osborne. Please sign a petition. We need your help. This I believe these men are innocent. I wouldn't I wouldn't say Mark was innocent if he wasn't. I mean, I've looked at the case. It needs further work to go before the CCRC, but um we're hoping you know we can do that. Like, you know, and I just want to give these people hope who are behind bars. So I just want to take just some I'm just gonna ask you some some quick questions, and I just want you to give me some quick answers, okay? Okay, yeah. So, miscarriage of justice cases, the biggest ones? I think um, the biggest one's still in prison now. Yeah. Is that, is that what you're arguing? Jeremy Bam's Yeah, so biggest, case. biggest miscarriage of justice cases still to be heard. Yeah, Jeremy Bamber's, I, I think um, Michael Stone's case as well. I think that's very that's a very important case. Uh, I, I believe they're the, they're, they are innocent. I think they're the two main cases. Um, the case of the Craig, Craig Avon too, as well. Uh, just want to give them a mention. It's an Irish case where the MI5 was involved in setting these two boys up, and uh, that's another case I'm involved in. That's a that's a quite a high profile one, you know, in, in Ireland and 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 just coming over here as well. So, you know, they're the three I would I'd be really concerned about. Worst thing that happened to you in jail. We're saying losing my daughter, I think. Losing my daughter in prison. I think that's still got to be the worst. I, I I was thinking about this the other night. You know, there's two issues. The wrongful imprisonment was that I, I would have taken that if my daughter would have still lived and I would have fought it. But, uh, you know, if I had a choice, but obviously you don't have choices in these matters, you know. And um, just one other quick point, if, if I can, is the case of Joe Fetter. It's the, it's the latest case in South Wales Police's history where there needs to be looked at. Joe Fetter's case was, a, briefly, there was an accident which occurred. Um, he didn't crash into that person. He was the secondary car behind, but the police tried to make out it was an impromptu race. Um, and yet there's a, lo- a lot of evidence there of police corruption where all the witnesses who gave evidence against him, one of them was given a brown envelope. A solicitor has made a statement to say he's seen what was going on at the sentencing hearing. And and they and these people were in serious trouble with the police, and they keep using people like that against decent people. Joe Joe Fetter has never been in trouble in his life before, and his life's been ruined. He got five years. So I think in relation to the two cases that I think we should you know should put more out on there. I think Joe Fetter. So Jody Jamil, if we can just put it into the descriptions, uh, Fetter, the link in relation to that, and and the link in relation to. Osborne, which we brought up just now. I think those two cases for me are ones that we should have a look at. I think we should have a look at that. I think we should um, see if there's some work that can be done around those because, you know, when you say to me, how can he be responsible when he's in jail? It's like, what on earth's going on? You know, how can you convict someone when they're in jail? Well, by all accounts, it's a joint enterprise. Mm. I mean, I mean, it- <laughs> that's a that's another that's another podcast for another day, isn't it? Joint enterprises. Yes, it, it, it I mean, is. I, but I, I promise. I try to get as many people's names as like I promise yeah. them all because I wanted to give them hope, and I hope I'm giving them hope that you know miscarriages mm. of justice do get overturned. Mm. 
Just so, Michael, fighting. I would like to have you back on another occasion where we can just talk about some of the wider context in relation to some of those and perhaps you know, even get uh, one of the, you know, the family members involved in one of these cases that you're dealing with. I mean, you are a mind full of knowledge. I have to say, you know, you know my background from policing and there are people in jail who are absolutely there for the right reason. Sometimes absolutely. the criminal justice system. Absolutely. Gets it. Yes, I agree. Sometimes. I've got to be honest with you. Honest with you. There's a couple of people who tried to pull the wool over my eyes. Recently, there was a case. Uh, I don't know if you know the case of John Kamara, the betting shop murder case, where the guy spent 20 years in prison. Well, his co-accused didn't show me any documents uh, and said he made one confession. I found out he jumped up in the dock and uh, admitted it, and he's telling everybody he's innocent. Right. His name's Ray Gilbert, and he's he's well known. And I mm. mean. Uh, I've ousted him on a podcast, which I've done a podcast with all the paperwork and the evidence because I don't, I, I'm not interested in helping guilty people. No. I want to make that clear because that's not what the criminal justice system is about. It's got to be fairness on both sides, isn't it? I don't want to see a murderer being released, but in the same token, I don't want to see an innocent person uh, being put in prison either. So it's got to work both ways. Absolutely. Well, so we've got a comment here from, from Julie saying, thank you for mentioning Mark Osborne's case, Michael. I appreciate help. Julie, just to let you know, we are going to have a look at this. This is something that is, you know, I was the first time I've heard about it today, but, uh, you know, along with uh, Jamil and Jody, let's have a look at it and let's see if we can perhaps, you know, push this further out into the public domain and have a look at the case in particular. It sounds to me as though there is, there is something wrong with that. So, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Michael, you've been a star. I, I am, you know, I can't change what's happened. All I can say to you is I'm so sorry you went through what you went through. But it's your your, your approach, your your commitment, not just then, but now in terms of getting justice for yourself and obviously what you're helping for other people. I think you do a sterling job. And I think, you know, it is people like you that we need. It's people like you that can stand up and take authority on. And, and that's why that's why I love what I do is because as a journalist, I think it's so important that we hold authority to account when they get it wrong. You know, we are we have, I think, one of the best criminal justice systems in the world, but they do sometimes get it wrong. And it's up to the media. It's up to journalists to hold Absolutely. the authorities to account. And uh, Michael, you do a sterling job. It's the first time I've ever, ever met you. And I'd like to stay in touch with you. And let's see if we can can move it on. And, and I'm certainly keen to see if we can do something on uh, Mark Osborne's case. You can see there we've popped it into the comments box. So thank you, Michael. You are a star. You look after yourself and take care. And thank you, everybody, for following us. Join us again thank next you, week when we're talking true crime. And in the meantime, follow us on our website. Follow us through our YouTube channel and keep an eye for social media, our Instagram page and our TikTok page, where you'll be able to see some of the cases that we talk about, some of the historic cases, but also some of those live cases that we're talking about you know, that are ongoing. We very much talked at the beginning of the conversation, the horrific case that's currently ongoing uh, in relation to uh, the missing girl, the missing lady, who has literally vanished. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, we are hoping, certainly over the forthcoming days, there will be some information in relation to Nicola Bully and some closure for the family. So thank you. Do keep in touch with us. Do drop us any messages or any notes, or, or even particularly if you want somebody for to us to interview someone for us to talk to that you think would be fascinating. We've got a, a list of individuals who are very keen to come on uh, my show and we'll get them on board over the forthcoming weeks. But let us know if you have somebody that you particularly want us to talk to. So thank you for the backroom staff of Jody and Jamil. And uh, until next week, I can't say it because it would be a bit of a cliche, but uh, take care and don't have nightmares. Thank you. Mm -hmm.